You are the VP at a large contractor that has recently took over a big construction site. There are two programs currently being executed. One, an ongoing maintenance program that is comprised of small projects. The other is an entirely new facility. There has been concerns about predictability based on past performance. How do you fix it? Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Beyond Deadlines podcast, where we tackle challenges that planning and schedule leaders come across on a day-to-day -day basis. My name is Micah Pipo, and I'm a planning and scheduling manager for Intel. And my name is Greg Lawton, and I'm the CEO of an AI schedule management company called Nods and Links. Each podcast is designed to give you strategies and tactics that you can implement right away. Today, Greg is on the hot seat, and we are going to dive deep into predictability. You ready, Greg? Let's go for it. You are the VP at a large contractor that has recently took over a big construction site. There are two programs currently being executed. One, an ongoing maintenance program that is comprised of small projects. The other is an entirely new facility. There has been concerns about predictability based on past performance. How do you fix it? Beautiful. Okay, dive in. Let's ask some questions. What exactly do people mean by predictability here? Projects are being finished late. Okay, so it's milestone predictability. So people yes. say, this will finish in June, it actually finishes in September or something like that. Okay, and um, do we have liquidated damages? So is are these fixed price contracts or are they... Uh, are they chain, are they uh, reimbursable? I'm not letting you off easy this morning. There are no LDs. I mean, you can't really have LDs on a small program. Like, what are you going to do? Enforce an LD? They're doing you know hundreds of projects. Oh, you finish this one late. We're going to charge you thirty dollars. Well, what I'm trying to get to, what I'm trying to get to here is to figure out where I should source my investigation first. Um, change is going to be a big thing that I need to look at here. So if there, are, if there are no LDs, is it is it still fixed price or is it reimbursable? Reimbursable. Reimbursable. Okay. So change. I told you you're on so, the hot seat today. <laughs> yeah, an uncontrolled version of change might be a thing. Okay. Um. Right. I'm going to I'm going to dive in because actually a lot more of the questions will be found out for an investigation. So my process from this would be first of all definitions. So what am I being targeted against? So, you know, in this instance, not to put words in your mouth, but I'm assuming our predictability is 50%. We want it above 80%, something like that. Yeah, that's a good start. What I'd look to do is to, first of all, find out, are we measuring predictability correctly? So I need a very, very solid baseline of which to stand, because if you start, if you start this entire process and dive into the detail, but you're standing on quicksand, you're never going to be able to prove or sort anything. The second element. Well, let me is... help you. Let me help you on, on that first element real quick. On the small projects program, they are unable to capture baselines because of how much change is in the program and how fast projects are coming in the shoot. And so they measure predictability basically a month out. So, you know, if you are anything four weeks out they basically lock and say that's their mini baseline on their new greenfield facility they want to do something more traditional and measure against a set of 20 milestones okay and is the greenfield in progress uh, uh, what percentage complete through the milestones are we? Let's see, this is your this is your golden goose it hasn't started yet and you can do whatever you want right okay okay so I'd approach these two things in very, very different ways. Um, the one which is many projects with a, a moving baseline. So for all, for all the listeners here, I want to give you what I call the predictability equation. And it's the five things that drive schedule predictability. It is task duration. It is 
relationship type. So if you've got very variable relationships, you can't tell when something's going to uh, to finish. It is uncertainty and risk. It's system information. So things like calendars. Uh, so, you know, it's a very big difference if people can work weekends versus if they cannot work weekends. And it is scope stability. So task, relationship, uncertainty and risk, system information, scope stability. From what you've just told me, I have chaos in terms of scope stability four weeks out. So really what we're looking here is less at a project and more at sprint operations with, with predictability being around work packages, pure work packages, not milestones. Is that correct? Yes. Nailed okay. it. And, start... and if you need to rewind, get a pencil, piece of paper and a pencil out or a pen or take a note on your phone and write down that equation, because that's going to save you hundreds of hours. Yeah, this is, that equation comes from someone who's analyzed tens of thousands of projects for this kind of stuff. <laughs> so write that down. That is the yeah, secret you, right there. <laughs> you know, it's funny about that. I thought about this morning, Greg, while I was making my coffee, trying to get me amped up for the show. When we first knew each other, I don't know, four or five years ago, whatever it was, I had reviewed at that point many more schedules than you ever had. And then as the years crept by, I like, you have now reviewed exponentially more schedules than me because that's your job, <laughs> essentially, part of it. Yeah. You know, is to like come in and help people review the schedules and use AI power tools. But then all of a sudden, I'm like, dang it, Greg has reviewed more schedules than me now. And I'm like, I'm not the master of reviewing schedules, Greg is. So take your title, take your belt, and carry on. Well, I'll, I'll cover that. Yes, I've definitely reviewed more at this point just because of scale, but I haven't gone in deep and fixed them. It's easy to sit on the outside and go, ooh, pretty data. It's a different thing to then go in and go, <laughs> so let's do something about this. <laughs> uh, anyway, so putting, putting that aside, I want to I wanna come back to something you said. So what we just said is in these fast-moving small projects that really they are sprint operations and we're measuring predictability based on work packages that only look out four weeks. But at the start, you said that predictability, I'm guessing from senior management, was being measured on milestones. So saying things were going to be finished in June, but they're actually in September. Correct. Boss, what am I being measured on? Those are two totally different things. Yeah. To me, you're being measured on both. And so I think there's probably a gap in some sort of system capturing process where they do have one final milestone that the customer's looking at, but they can't track change against it so they need to do something yep. else right so in this instance there are two options number one is to say we live let's let's cut the crap this isn't a stable project this is workforce on demand you're giving us work packages four weeks out and it's workforce on demand you can measure predictability probably within a two-week period, maybe a four-week period, but let's cut the crap. There's no such thing as a milestone per month towards a major project. That you just if you're if you're if that's how this is working, this is not a project properly. Or the second is let's cut the crap. If there is unlimited change, based on the predictability equation, there is no predictability. We either come up with a strategy to control this change and to account for it, or we come up with a strategy to reduce the change so it's, it is manageable. So what I mean is, the first one is we capture every change that happens we, we, and, and we iterate on the baseline every single time so that we can give predictability on the end milestone based on the prevailing scope of work at that point in time. Or the other one is we just reject it. We just say, no chips. I'm not doing it. You, you can't have that room red. It's brown. Sorry. Okay. And it's, it, that really is more of, is 
the answer to this part of the question is not an analytical one. The answer to this part of the question is stakeholder management and contractual. And probably giving people a reality check. Now, you did say that there were two sets of projects. One is a portfolio of small projects and one is a big project that's just about started and it's Greenfield. Can I ask? Yeah. Do we expect a significant amount of customer-driven change to come in this big Greenfield project? In this example, similar customer, and while it's a different project, you can assume that there will be a heavy amount of change. How much of the and design as you transition? Complete? None so far. You're just laying <laughs> okay, the foundations so... and groundwork. <laughs> So you're, right. this is where, and one question I have for you is what sort of lessons would you take from this smaller project into the bigger one as you start to, to set up your strategy? That's where I really want this conversation to go because predictability in the moment isn't going to actually help your projects all that much. You're going to insert it into a midway through or two thirds through a project and you're going to be controlling a fire. If you started mm -hmm. at the very beginning, you're building a fire station and firefighters and you're teaching people about fire safety and you're really suppressing that. So walk us through what are your strategies at the beginning that you're going to roll over that is really going to increase predictability on the screen field? So there's quite a few, there's quite a few facets to that. But the, the, fundamental, the fundamental answer is benchmarking and triangulation. Um, appropriate process and governance design and uh, review periods. So to start with, doing the, the triangulation and benchmarking element, the difference between a small project, and I'm talking here in terms of amount of work, tasks, dependencies, this kind of thing, and a big complex project, is that the failure cascades of small projects are confined to being small. And a big project is that the failure cascades of small problems are not confined. They can grow into very big problems. It's just, think of it like if you get a virus on an island of 10 people, 10 people could get infected. But if you get a virus that's global, well, we've got 8 billion right there. Hey, um, now I don't got to work anymore. And yes. <laughs> my house, my family. What I'd say in this regard... A lot more glass bottles in the recycling. <laughs> What I'd, what I'd say in this regard is um, I would simply, well, what I try and do is I would try and find representative projects. So, for example, I've just performed an analysis for a friend of mine. Uh, they had, uh, I won't say the, the field, but they had 16 past projects that they've done that were very representative of the seventh they were about to do. And he threw us all of the data files. And basically, we measured the the activity accuracy, so the actual duration versus baseline, the change amount, the relationship, basically the predictability equation, and basically told him, if you were to want 100% predictability back at the start of those projects, this is what the numbers would have to be, because it was what they ended up being, which has informed, obviously, the 17th he's done, which then comes down to number two, which is governance and process. Before you jump to governance and process, I want to go back there and highlight something for the crowd because I run into this all the time. What Greg is doing there is he isn't looking at an activity that says install steel frame A and going and figuring out what the weight, the length, and, and all of the this like detailed analysis of activity A and then trying to go find another activity in his future schedule that exactly matches that. Over the course of time, how likely is that team to actually hit their steel activities? Because you can use that as a proxy on your future projects to step around the fact that this building is probably, while it's representative, it's not going to be exact. People confuse that all of the time and they throw yep. out benchmarking data and benchmarking things or they go down this path of, I have to find this exact thing to make it exactly right. You don't have to do that. You can use proxies and close enoughs and that percentages to really find out where your project's going to fall. I'll give you an example of, of those projects I looked at. Um, like 
uh, it, it was a large civil industrial job and approvals are a very big thing. Approvals on average were about 250% longer than forecast minus about 100% plus about 400%. So they could take up to 650%, so 6.5 times longer than they forecast, and the average was 2.5 times longer. All that's telling me is, unless you've got a ton of float sitting around approvals, you're probably talking out your ass. You're very yeah, hopeful, exactly. how I'd put it in a nicer way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so the, the, you, number two, you're going on to governance. Let's keep on this yes. train. So I'd go, into go, I'd go into governance and process. And I go into governance and process because let, let's not consider this a project. Let's consider this a series of experiments with the goal of trying to get to perfect predictability. I'm starting out with no data. Just as in the last example where I said there's different options and one of the, basically two of them are control change i.e. you have a very, very good change process to account for it, or you just say no and don't allow change. If you're at 0% design, you're going to have to allow for change. So I would say I'd establish an incredibly rigorous change process that would probably batch up a number of changes and perform formal contract movement reviews and baseline reviews probably every month or every six weeks. And I'd also have a process of analyzing uh, time period based data. So for example, another project that I recently analyzed, I had all of the data files for that, the entire portfolio actually, that project and about seven others, and they took snapshots every two weeks. So I'm looking at two week predictability, four week, six week, eight week, 12 week predictability, and I'm cohorting it to see where we're trending on this kind of stuff because the devil is in the detail. People will go, oh, well, um, oh, it wasn't on the critical path, so it doesn't really matter too much. And I'm like, no, no, no. How you do one thing is how you do everything. You, if, if, if you've got a culture of slippages are okay or permitted or it, it expected to a large extent, it, that's going to catch up with you eventually. So I'm trying to look at actually more human behavior here. But if you have that cycle of review periods, you're going to get a very, very early warning to any milestone slippages. Because, for example, again, in another data set, I remember looking and I, I believe there's six week time box. So the difference between one schedule and then six weeks later, the next one, the activities within that time box. I think they were profiling at 60%, 66% longer than they forecast, plus or minus, I think it was minus about 30, plus about 100%. Whatever you say, it's not on time. So that comes to the, the third element, which is really kind of the, the activity and the culture that we were, were talking about. What I would do there is I would actually stand up a team that does two things. One is understands what is driving the delay because data analysis can tell you there's predictability problems. It can't tell you why they're happening. And the second is they work with the teams to fix it. Now, working with the teams to fix it can happen on a ground level where you're actually just working together to try and achieve a common KPI, but it could also have top-down support in terms of incentives. So I was talking with the project director of a large project a number of months ago, and I suggested because of the, the complexity and the chaos of their project, that they actually might want to put global incentives on every project member on a percentage of their yearly earnings on predictability. So for example, if you're in the pipe fitting shop, like, and you are within five or 10% of your forecast, you get an extra 20% of your wage as a bonus just to really drive home the, the behaviors of that level of forecasting. So then if you combine basically external benchmarking, internal benchmarking, change control, top-down incentives and KPIs, and in-team working, you're then able to do two things. One is control predictability. The second is 
developed such a deep understanding of how things actually happen that you are able to plan future projects to a, in all honesty, to a completely different game than the rest of the industry. Because I think, Micah, you and I, you know, the things I'm saying here, you and I know, and the listeners probably too, how little people actually do what I just said. You folks, you just got a masterclass in predictability right there. That was, there's so much to unpack there. And we're coming to the end of this episode. We, we, each of those little segments could be its own entire episode. One thing that came to mind when you were talking about float, I just thought float reminds me of cupcakes at a kid's party when the parents say it's okay to eat cupcakes. And people going in and just shoving their face with float. Mm -hmm. That stuff just boop gone. And in large complex projects, you don't often know that the, I would say the, the second tertiary and the fourth and fifth critical paths. And so when people are gobbling up float, you never really quite know, is that really being gobbled up off of critical pieces? By tracking that and keeping a good awareness of it, it just lets you know where you're at on it. And if you're listening and a lot of this stuff either went over your head or you're sitting there lost in the space about how can I export these files out into Excel and do some of these analysis. It's 2024, folks. You don't have to do that. There are <laughs> software out there that can help you with this. Greg works for one company, Nodes and Links. There are many out there. If you're going to go the homebrew route, make sure you're doing your automations uh, and, and, and really dialing those in so they're operationalized. But if you're just getting started in P6 and a lot of this stuff went over your head, trust me, you can work through this fairly easily. Start it off with small chunks. Go get some software. Help yourself out and make it easier for you. Because these are the sorts of things that Greg legged out that are going to improve your project's predictability, bring your projects in on time. And then guess what? You're going to look great for it. Go get that promotion uh, for 2024 because you helped improve your predictability. Greg, before we jump off the show, any final thoughts? Uh, yeah, what, I, what I'd say to people here is all of what I've said may sound complex today, but if you re-listen to it a couple of times, actually it's some super simple frameworks. And for me, if you try to implement this and you come up with 10 Power BI dashboards, you, you've missed the entire point of what this is. Um, when I analyze projects for predictability, I use about two graphs. And those two graphs can pretty much tell me everything I need to know about that project and be able to dive it. This is about total simplicity. Like one of those graphs is of the scope that existed in the last period, how much of it did we do on time? And the other graph is how much has the scope changed? And if either of those are top and to the right, I know this project's broken. It's really that simple. Like you can you can make an, an entire profession diving into the details of how you fix it, but measuring it is not complex. And I'd, I'd say, just keep it simple to start with. That makes it easier to explain to people. I mean, you're, you're much, much easier to explain to people. All right, folks, that brings us to the end of this episode. We do really appreciate you listening. If you could hit that subscribe button, help us out. We do this for free every week because we love it. And your subscriptions and your support help us out so much. Beyond Deadlines also has a newsletter sent to your inbox every single week. Every Monday, you get tips just like you got on the show that'll help you uh, out in your career. So for everyone, thank you. And we'll see you next week.